Welcome. Welcome to Montreal West United Church, and I'm so happy that you could be here to join us this morning for our worship. And we'd like to begin our worship service, as we normally do, with a few announcements. But as you know, if you've been following our broadcast over the last two weeks, we now have a brand new announcement letter. And so uh, all of these uh, announcements are contained in this letter for you. And, uh, and if you've been downloading this this announcement letter which comes with your invitations to this service then you know it always contains a joke or a riddle and this week it actually contains two two jokes or riddles well two jokes in this case so uh, uh please download the the letter and thank you to vicky for doing this and uh my only announcement from the letter is just to remind you that we're still looking for gardeners uh, we have huge and beautiful gardens here at Montreal West, and so we're looking for lots of people to come and tend little patches of the garden as a, as a gift to the church and as a gift to the community to, uh, to make this just a beautiful place. And hopefully you will enjoy, enjoy spending time with the earth and with the flowers and with the birds and squirrels this summer. So, uh, so gardeners, and one of the jokes, of course, is a gardening joke. And uh, I'd just like to thank everyone again for last week's very special service. It was uh, our Young People Service, Christian Family Sunday, and we did a, a beautiful service. The young people were sensational. Thank you to everyone who, uh, who really contributed to that service. And those of you who watched the service already, if you haven't seen it, you can always go back and see it. But those who have watched the service will know that we had a special arrangement of flowers. Now, that service wasn't filmed here in the sanctuary. It was filmed online so that the, the kids could all work together in a safe way. But we did have a special presentation of flowers, and I didn't have a chance to tell you about them. Those were a gift dedicated in the memory of Fred Motten. It was VE Day on behalf of VED, and also uh, VE Day, and also it's Mother's Day. So, uh, so uh, thank you to the Motten family, to Roy, to Tanya, to Eileen, and uh, and what a beautiful gift of flowers for for that special, very special service last week. This week is Nursing Week. I was listening to the radio today, and as I came in, there were all sorts of things on nursing. Has there ever been a year? I'm sure there has, but uh, a year where nurses have shone brighter than this year. Uh, this has been a very, uh, a very, very challenging year and what would we be where would we be without nurses so thank you we celebrate you we thank you uh, and being the son of a nurse i uh, i really want to take time to really honor and uh, and express my respect my appreciation and uh, how much uh, i appreciate nurses everywhere so uh, today those are my announcements i also have to tell you that there is confirmation class today at one o'clock after the service so uh, once again thanks to all the young people last week and you met our confirmands which was one of the highlights of the service for me and uh, we will have confirmation class this year uh, this this day so those are my announcements and uh, i would also like to say again welcome to the church and we're ready to begin our worship let's light our christ candle As we light this candle, I'll remind you of Christ's promise to us that whenever two or more of us gather, he's here among us. Now I'd like to invite you to pray with me our opening prayer. This prayer is written by Reverend Susan A. Blaine and Reverend Scott Reisman. Thank you to both of them for providing us with this beautiful prayer. Now, my friends, let us pray. O living God of past and future, we praise you for this present moment. Fill us with your joy and empower us with your Holy Spirit, that our strength may be renewed to sing a new song of your glory in a world which longs for your justice and peace. And we ask all of this in the strong name of Jesus, in whom we become your new creation. Amen. Joy 
everybody and welcome to our children's moment this morning I'd like to just call all the young people to come and gather around their screens their phones whatever it may be uh, so that they can uh, share in this children's time there will be Sunday school today at about 1030 so hopefully we're a little early we have some time to relax and spend together and today I want to start by talking about this little coin I have it probably looks really small to you but this is a loony so it's one of the bigger coins that we use here in Canada and on one side there's a picture of the head uh, of, of, of the Queen and on the other side there's there's a loon which is why we call it a loony and we can use a coin to buy things I'm sure you all know that a coin can be used to buy things but what else can a coin be used for let me give you a hint you see what I did I spun the coin in the air, I, I flicked it and it went round and round, then I caught it and I put it on my hand, and then you say to the person, heads or tails? Do you want the side with the queen's head or with the loony on it? The loony, of course, that has, a, has a tail, tail feathers. So this is how we make decisions. Maybe when you've played sports, we've decided which side to start on or who gets the ball first by flipping a coin and saying heads or tails. Uh, this was heads, by the way. So uh, this is my story today. I, I want to talk about this flipping coins or what we used to call casting lots. Uh, today is the story of the, the, the choice for a new disciple. The disciples had an empty spot amongst them. Uh, they needed to be 12 and they only had 11 disciples at the time. And uh, so this is the story of how they chose another disciple. And they had to choose between a disciple named Joseph and a disciple named Matthias. And they couldn't choose. And so they cast lots. They put uh, two stones in a jar and shook the jar and then spilled to see which stone came out first. It's the same thing as spinning a coin and saying heads or tails. So they cast lots and Matthias won. And Matthias became the new disciple, the new member of the 12 disciples. And uh, that's the story of Matthias. And what I want to talk to you is about how they made that choice because I was reading something and uh, and a young person was talking about the choice of Matthias and they s the young person said did the disciples let God choose between Joseph and Matthias Joseph and Matthias were two people who wanted to join the disciples they only had room for one and so they flipped a coin and they chose Matthias to join them so by flipping a coin and letting the outcome be by the by the, the the turn of a coin was that letting God choose 
And it kind of was, but it also kind of wasn't. When we do things like spinning coins or rolling dice, God doesn't control those things. Those things are kind of random. They can't be predicted. And so in that sense, God didn't choose between Matthias and Joseph. The fact is, God only makes decisions based on love. And so God needed to make, the, God would have wanted us to make the decision between these two people based on love as well. So why did the disciples use a coin? Well, in those days, quite often when people were choosing between two people, they would pick their favorite. Maybe you've been in that position where you, someone was choosing between you and another person and you didn't feel it was fair. They were going to pick their friend or they were going to pick their family member. And the disciples were aware of that. And so by using a coin, they were making sure that the decision was, while it was a bit random, it was at least fair because um, they, they weren't just going to pick their favorite person or the person they liked more. So that's one reason they used a coin, and that was loving. So I think God would have been happy with that decision. But the other reason was I think they were trying to say that Joseph and Matthias were both amazing people. They were both perfectly good and able to join the 12 disciples. And they, if they had said, I'm going to pick Joseph or I'm going to pick Matthias, maybe it would have made the other person feel bad because we think he's better or we think he's better. So by spinning a coin, by casting lots, it was actually a very loving thing to do because they said, we love you both and we can't choose between you. And so we're just going to let the coin decide. It wasn't God deciding. God would never choose between people like that, but they let the coin decide. And that's the story of how Matthias was chosen to become one of the disciples. And I guess my message is that, that a lot of people think by spinning coins or, you know, uh, s putting rocks in a jar that somehow that would be a way to, uh, to, to know what God wants and that uh, what's being decided is God's will. But that's not quite true. The only way that God makes deci decisions and the only basis by which God makes decisions is what is more loving. And if you ever want to know what God wants, you have to ask yourself that. What's the nicest thing to do here? What's the kindest thing to do here? What's the most loving thing to do here? That's the only way that God makes decisions. But it was kind of a neat story on how the disciples found a loving way with, with a coin or with, with stones to choose who would join them. And so that's my story today and uh, a little bit about God so that you can remember God doesn't roll dice, God doesn't flip coins, but God does sometimes use a coin or a dice in if that's the loving thing to do. And in this case, it was. So that's my story. And uh, I'll now invite you to pray with me. Loving God, thank you for being a God who always does the loving thing, never, never chooses one over the other, but always tries to find a way to resolve difficult choices by doing what's nicest, kindest, and most loving. Thank you for being here in this children's moment. And uh, if you ever have any questions about these children's moments, I hope you'll send me an email or call me up on the phone and ask me. Uh, I, I enjoy doing these children's moments, but uh, it's a little different when you're not here to ask questions. I miss you, and I hope you have fun in Sunday school today. Say hi to Mary, and God bless. Our reading this morning is from Acts 1, verses 15 to 17 and 21 to 26. The disciples choose Matthias. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons. And he said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who had a, have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in 
and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken from us. One of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, God, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Here ends our reading. Thank you, Nancy. Today's reflection is about the choices we make. It's about choices, specifically the choices we make as a church family. Today's scripture reading that we just heard is about the choice of Matthias as a replacement for Judas amongst the 12 disciples. But where I really want to begin this reflection may come as a surprise. I want to begin in New York in the 1970s. You didn't see that coming, did you? New York in the 70s is a place and time that the 12 disciples, including Matthias, could never have even imagined. But it was the location of Studio 54. Studio 54 was a famous New York City nightclub and probably the most famous nightclub on the planet in the 70s. It was the center of the world during the days of disco. And you'll be glad to know, however, that I don't really plan to talk about disco today or nightclubs, but what I do want to talk about is the reason that Studio 54 was so successful. Studio 54 was huge, spanning many floors. The location was originally built in the 1920s as a theater, and it was then transformed into a television studio by CBS. Fun facts. The $64,000 question and the Jack Benny show were shot where Studio 54 uh, eventually was, uh, became. It was sold and it was converted into a nightclub in the early 70s, but being an old television studio made it a great place for a nightclub. It was perfectly adaptable to quick overnight transformations of set and lighting, allowing the club to constantly change its look. And no expense was spared on the club's look. Over the years, there were circus performers, acrobats, celebrities on horseback on the dance floor, and up to four tons of glitter could be showered down on partygoers on any given night. Some people said that they would find glitter in their clothes for two weeks after being in Studio 54 for just one night. But none of those things are the real reason that Studio 54 was so successful. In the words of a disco era historian, I bet you didn't know there were any disco era historians, but there are, and in their words, despite all the extravagance and glitter, there actually wasn't anything at Studio 54 that you couldn't find in other high-end clubs at the time. No, the real reason for its historic success was some psychological trickery mastered by the club's owner, Steve Rubell. Rubel's trick had two parts. First, no matter how few people there were in the club on any given night, he always kept a lineup outside. Even if there was no one in the club spending money, he would still keep people waiting outside. He believed that having a line was that important. The second thing he did, ironically, was to make the line almost completely irrelevant. He reserved the right to choose who got into his club. So standing in line didn't even guarantee anything. The line was really just for show because being chosen was actually the only way to get into the club. And when it came to being chosen, being chosen to enter the club was just the first choice. Rubel also divided his nightclub into a hierarchy of sections with each section being another step up in the club. So after standing in the line for several hours, and sometimes people would stand there all night and never be chosen, but assuming one was finally chosen, one would then discover that being chosen only meant that they had been admitted to the first section of the club, the general admittance section. If one wanted to go into the private section, they had to, you guessed it, be chosen again. This 
according to historians of the era, was the true genius of Steve Rubell and the secret of the mystique and massive session with Studio 54 in the 70s. This never-ending series of echelons, first you wait to get into the club, then to get into the private section, then the VIP private section, and then the celebrity-only VIP private section, and then the owner's private section. This is what made Studio 54 so successful. Steve Rubell knew people, and he manipulated people by dividing the world into inside and outside, in crowd and out crowd, those who belonged and those who didn't. He knew that he could make people want what he had to sell. He knew that if he could convince people they were out, they'd do anything to get in. No matter where you were in the club or how long it took you to get there, how much money it cost you to get there, there was always another place, just a little out of your reach, where you wanted to be, where he would make you think you wanted to be. So what does any of this have to do with Matthias, Matthias the 13th disciple? Well, that isn't actually true. Technically, there were never, ever 13 disciples. There were always 12. 12 seems to have had some significance for Jesus and his followers. We don't know exactly why. Jesus never says, but we assume it had to do with the number of tribes that made up the nation of Israel. Jesus never says anything about the number 12, but he did happen to have 12 disciples. And today's reading, we learned that 12 then became very important to the disciples themselves. They believed that they should always have 12 since Jesus had 12 in his lifetime. So with Judas gone, they immediately go about the business of electing a new disciple, a new disciple to the top, to the 12, the top echelon of disciples. Why do I say the top echelon? Well, it certainly seems to be the case, at least according to Luke. Remember that Luke wrote the book of Acts, from which today's reading is taken, but also Luke wrote a gospel. And in the sixth chapter of that gospel, Luke tells us that the twelve disciples were chosen from a larger group of disciples. And then in the tenth chapter, Luke describes the larger group. Luke says that besides the 12 disciples, there was also a group of 72 disciples. So it seems there were at least two echelons of disciples, the 72 and the 12. Guess which one was higher up? Well, in order to answer that, consider this. The early church put together everything that they knew about Matthias about a hundred years after he died. The church suddenly realized that they knew very little about the 13th, 12th disciple. He was uh, chosen to be, why was he chosen to join the 12? Why was he chosen over Joseph Justice, who was the other person who was considered in the, in the reading? Uh, and who was Matthias? Now the church had a problem about a hundred years after Matthias's life, much of his life had been forgotten. And so the record of who Matthias was was lost to history. So the church went around trying to find out everything they could. Uh, they knew from the book of Acts that Matthias had known Jesus from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He had been present at Jesus' baptism. But other than that, there was nothing that they had in Scripture that said anything about Matthias. So the church tried to retrieve everything it could. And what they found out was that Matthias was remembered for spreading Christianity to the north all the way to the Black Sea. But what Matthias was, what was most remembered about Matthias was how he died. He died in Jerusalem. He was martyred and he had been beheaded after being stoned. He had been beheaded with an ax. These were all of the facts that the church was able to find out about Matthias. This was all that was remembered about Matthias a hundred years after he lived. In fact, the axe became his symbol since nothing else was known about him. In depictions of St. Matthias in sculpture and painting throughout the Middle Ages, he is always recognized by the fact that he's carrying an axe or standing beside one, which is kind of dark and an almost twisted way of remembering him, how he died. But there was one other thing that was remembered about Matthias. It was remembered that before being chosen to join the Twelve, he had been a member of the Seventy-Two. So it would seem that joining the Twelve was kind of like a promotion to another echelon. 
which leads me to question today's reading and some of the early practices and values and choices made by the early church. As human beings, we construct our world. We decide how it should be organized. For instance, the fact that a group should have 12 or 72 members, that's kind of a human thing. We worry about those things. That's how we structure and organize our world. Animals kind of accept the world as it is, but as human beings, we construct and order our world and we decide what has value to us. It's my belief that what Jesus came to do, in fact, really had to do with this ordering and valuing of the world. I believe Jesus came to teach us what is most valuable and how our values could reshape how we construct our world. That's why I have so many questions about today's reading and why it kind of challenges me. As happy as it makes me to know that Matthias was chosen, all I can think of is poor Joseph Justice. I mean, his very name, not his birth name, but the name he was given by the other disciples so that they could tell him apart from all the other Josephs in the world, literally means the just one. Why did the church believe they needed to limit the inner circle to 12? Why did they feel they needed to have an inner circle at all? Was it necessary? Did Jesus really want that? I don't know. But to me, Jesus' life was spent bringing people together, not setting them apart, not keeping them out. I also have a problem with echelons. I mean, the way that most of the, most of the disciples, including Matthias, died, maybe losing that election was Joseph the Just's luckiest day. But there can be no doubt that the Twelve received a great deal of honor and veneration from the early church. And it kind of makes me think of Steve Rubel creating a hierarchy for the followers of Jesus. First there's the everyday follower, then there's the 72 special followers, and then there's the 12 celebrity VIP followers. It kind of makes me question if Jesus ever wanted the world to be ordered that way. There's something about it that doesn't seem to fit with Jesus' other's teachings. We know that the church has struggled at times throughout history to discern between what Jesus really taught and how the church received and understood what Jesus was trying to teach. The fact that all that is remembered of St. Messiah is a good example of this. What did people remember? Pretty much how he died. This gives me cause for concern about the early church's priorities and values. It really seems that the church was a little too focused on death rather than what the person did in life. I'm sure St. Matthias was a warm and loving person. I'm sure he lived a life selflessly and for other people. He must have been a very special person to have been chosen from among the 72, including a man literally named the just. But if Matthias was such a good person, why was the church so quick to forget all the stories of his compassion, caring, and love, and only remember that he was elected to the 72, he was elected to the 12, he brought the message north, and he was decapitated by an axe? It seems so macabre that the only history we have of poor Matthias is the axe, the axe which killed him. I'm not sure the church was focused on the right things back then. And I think we have to ask ourselves today about the choices that we're making as the church. What does it mean for us to be Christian? What does it mean for us to be the church? It seems to me that churches, just like people, can get fooled into all kinds of confusions and strange ways of thinking. We can be fooled into valuing all kinds of things that never make our life any better or the world any better. It's too easy for people to become distracted by glitter and mystique or become fixated on things that don't matter like numbers or echelons. It seems to me as Christians, we should know what truly matters and really focus our lives on nothing but that. It seems to me that the only echelon, 
that ever mattered to Jesus were the echelons of love within our hearts. When it comes to love, there is no inside or outside, no in-crowd or out-crowd, and definitely no lines to get in. When it comes to love, there is no us and them. There's only us. When it comes to love, all are welcome. And there is always room for one more. Amen. now time for us to pray together. Before we do, we have been receiving so much support. Uh, even though we haven't been gathering or passing the plate, donations have been coming in. And uh, as we started a few weeks ago, we need to take time to say thank you for these amazing blessings. So let's bless the gifts that we've received. Loving God, we bring our gifts to you. Here is the work of our hands and here is the love of our hearts. Accept us and all of our gifts. May we and they give hope, provide hope to a world in need, and change a world which is still under construction. Amen. Now it's time for us to pray. Our prayers today are taken from, are based on a prayer that I found on a website called praywithme.com. I'd like to begin by saying that there are many people and many reasons for us to pray today. We certainly hold Israel and Palestine in our hearts. And we pray that their mutual and common love of God may bring them together in peace. We continue to pray for the people of India and all those around the world and even in our own community who are still suffering due to COVID, suffering from illness or isolation. And on this day, we pray also for all the nurses 
of the world and all the people of the world providing nursing care. This is a time for nurses to shine, a time for us to be grateful for all of the care that we receive in times when care is so important. Now it's time for us to pray. God of light, we have heard your message proclaimed of old that in you there is no dark cloud at all. Nothing exists that can hide the light of your presence. Forgive us when we cling to the shadows, failing to heed your call to wake up and join the work of your reign. Send us to do your deeds of mercy and peace, to feed the hungry, to shelter the homeless, to care for the sick, and to offer them your healing balm. Guide us through the shadows. Keep us from despair. When we see that there is no peace in our cities, no love in our communities, lift our eyes towards you that we may see your face and walk in your light. Comfort with your presence those who are living in the shadow of grief, violence, anger, loss, illness, loneliness, fear, or division. Give assurance to all who are apart that one day we will all be together, certain of being joined again in the unbroken circle where all sing of your love forever. Continuing to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here and joining us, sharing worship with us this morning. Thank you to all the people who have worked so hard to uh, make this service possible. Thank you to Kevin and Roy for being here with me and filming, and for Kevin for filming and editing the service. Thank you to Samantha and Owen and the choir, our leads. Thank you to Stevie for the beautiful music and all the beauty that they bring into these services. Thank you to Nancy for being our reader today. Thank you to Vicki for our announcement sheet. Thank you again to all of you for being here, for taking time to be with God and to be a community of God. I'd like to leave you with this blessing, which I found from Reverend Gord, posted on his blog, Worship Offerings. As people of faith, we have gathered for worship. As people of faith, we now return to the world. Go out to share the stories of our faith, the stories of true life, bigger and better life, and the most interesting people on earth. We are the church. We share the faith in word and deed, in speech and action. As you go out to give a living witness as you go out to testify to God's love active in the world, go knowing that God goes with you, sharing the laughter, sharing the hope. May the grace of God and the love of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always until we're together again. Go in peace. Amen.